Numbers. They're around us all over the place. We see them and use them every day. And science, of course, is no exception. When we measure something, whether we be weighing it, or determining the volume, or timing the rate of something, we constantly use numbers in science, and we present our data using these numbers. And we expect our readers to be able to interpret these numbers. And it's important to understand how numbers are communicated and to have an appropriate way of communicating our confidence in these numbers. That is, what degree of precision have we used when expressing these values? And we refer to this as significance. That is, we classify these numbers as being significant, and we call them either significant figures or significant digits. Well, when we're dealing with numbers, we have a couple of different types of numbers that we can first discuss. There are counted numbers and there are measured numbers. So counting numbers is pretty easy when we're talking about the precision or significance of those values. There's no uncertainty involved when we count numbers of things. So for example, if we take a look at my hand, I know for sure that there are five digits there, four fingers and one thumb. I can count those and see those. I know with certainty that there are five things there. If I was to measure my hand, though, let's say from the base of my palm all the way to the tip of my middle finger, it would depend on the device that I'm using. I could be using a ruler that measures to centimeters or millimeters, and even then there's going to be some degree of uncertainty because I could theoretically have a ruler that could be measuring in progressively smaller and smaller increments. So there's always some degree of estimation or some degree of uncertainty when we're measuring something. So we typically say that all of these measured quantities possess some certain digits, that is those values that we are certain that it is at least that much, and one estimated or something that we call that uncertain digit. And that's the last digit that we have in our measurements. We need to stop for a conceptual check here. I've brought up the term precision, and quite often in science, we try and use the term precision along with accuracy, and a lot of the time those two get mixed up as being synonymous terms. Yes, you can have something that's both precise and accurate, but the two terms themselves can be quite different. If we take a look at precision, precision is really based on the device that you're using, how precise that device is. And usually we correlate that with the degree of the increments that we're using to measure it. So for example, if we were using a ruler, a ruler that measured to, say, millimeters would be more precise than a ruler that measured to centimeters. And when we deal with, say, an electronic balance, an electronic balance that measured to the hundredth of a gram would be more precise than one that would measure to the gram. So when we talk about precision, it all has to do with the device that we're using to measure. Now with accuracy, it's how close we are to the accepted value. So the two things are quite different when you go to think about it, and we can use a little bit of an analogy to help us out here. So if we take a look at these two targets, we notice that precision just means that it's getting repetitive, very close values to one another. But let's say that device isn't calibrated properly. That is, we're using, let's say on electronic balance, 100 gram mass, and it keeps reading, time after time after time, 102.1 grams. Well, it's precise, it's measuring to the tenth of a gram, and it's doing so repeatedly, but it's not accurate, it's not close to the accepted value. Whereas an accurate measurement would be right around that 100 grams, maybe 99.8 and 99.9 and 100.1, but it's not being all that precise. So, there is a distinction that needs to be made between accuracy and precision, and it's significant figures that actually help us communicate that precision. Now, how do we assign significance to numbers in a number? That is, how do we determine how many significant digits or how many significant figures are in a value? Well, really, if the number is a non-zero, we consider it significant. It's when we have zeros added in that it gets a little tricky. And generally the rule is, if zeros are placeholders, we do not count them as being significant. So we tend to say that leading zeros, that is zeros that appear in front of the first non-zero, are not significant. And trailing zeros are only significant if there's a decimal place present. So let's take a look at an example here. Here we have 780 centimeters. Now it could be that the device that was used was used to measure exactly 780 centimeters. But we don't know. There's a little bit of ambiguity there. We're not entirely sure whether it's a precise device measuring at 780 centimeters exactly, 
or if that 780 centimeters was approximated. So if we were to take a look at a number like 780.0, that ambiguity is removed. We can count those trailing zeros. In 780, that trailing zero is not significant, and there's only two significant figures. In 780.0, because that decimal place is present, what that indicates to us as an interpreter of this data is that whomever took the measurement of this particular set of data included that tenth of a centimeter, or one millimeter, because they're trying to communicate that they were using that level of precision with their measurements. So 780.0 actually possesses four significant figures. If we're getting into ambiguity, that is, we're uncertain if looking at a number communicates the appropriate number of significant figures, we use something that we refer to as scientific notation. Now scientific notation removes this ambiguity because what it does is it takes a really large number or a really small number and assigns it an appropriate number of significant figures. So if we had a value of 780 and we wanted to communicate that it did have three significant figures that we were measuring to that level of precision, we would write it as such. 7.80 times 10 to the 2 centimeters. Now I'm not going to go into a long explanation as to how we use scientific notation. If that's something that you're um, a little bit wary of how to use, you might want to go take a look at that. But basically we take a value between 1 and 9 that's going to represent our number, so 7.80 is between 1 and 9. We multiply it by 10 and raise it to some exponent. That is the number of times we would have to multiply it by 10 to get our number. So 7.80 times 10 and times 10 again would be 780. But what it does again is it removes that ambiguity, so if we're trying to communicate three significant figures, 780 Ooh, that could mean 2, but 7.80 times 10 to the 2 removes that ambiguity and we know for certain that it's three significant figures. Now where significant figures really come into play is when we're using them in calculations. And this is probably where most students are going to see significant figures and have to remember those significant figure rules the most. Now in multiplication and division, and in addition and subtraction, in fact in any manipulation that you make with these numbers, you cannot assume precision. So you have to represent your answer in the least precise value that you're using. But the rules are a little different for multiplication and division than they are for addition and subtraction. So in multiplication and division, we are going to represent our final answer in the same number of significant figures as the value that we used with the fewest. So whichever value has the fewest number of significant figures in our multiplication or division, our final answer has to have that same number of significant figures as well. In addition and subtraction, the value with the least precise measurement is what we're going for. So really, the one with the fewest number of decimal places is what we're looking at. Not clear? Well, let's take a look at an example for each. Let's say for multiplication and division, we have a number of 1,234 and we're multiplying it by 56.7. Let's count out those significant figures. So for 1,234, we have all non-zero, so they're all significant. One, two, three, four, we have four significant figures there. For 56.7, we have no zeros there either, but they are all significant as well. However, we're multiplying a number with four significant figures by a number with three significant figures, so our final answer has to have three significant figures. So you can go ahead and try this, but I think you're probably going to have to represent your answer using scientific notation. So you can practice that as well when you're expressing this value. Taking a look at addition and subtraction, let's say we were to add these two numbers together. Well, yes, we still have four significant figures and three significant figures respectively, but we have no decimal places and one decimal place, that is we're measuring to the one value in 1234 and to the tenth in 56.7. So 56.7 is more precise despite the fact that it has fewer significant figures and 1234 is less precise, so we have to express our value to the one place or there can't be any decimals in our final answer. Now our final answer will have more significant figures, four, than our lowest value, which was 56.7, but with addition and subtraction, the rules are a little different, so we have to present it appropriately. Now, most students tend to take issue with significant figures because it's just one more thing to think about, but I promise you, if you practice it, and think about it every single time you are going through a calculation step, 
it's going to become easier and easier. It's just one more skill that you have to practice when you're going through calculations, but it will pay dividends when you're trying to communicate these values to the scientific community. Thanks for watching.